Good day, Taruna. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. Hello, Guy. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this HPD video series. I am so humbled by your invitation. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Well, thank you. I, so you and I haven't met or talked before this. We just exchanged some emails, me asking you to do this, but I've seen things that you posted that suggested to me that you are a performance-oriented kind of person. And so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to learn a little bit more and share that with my audience about you and your performance orientation. So to get started, I have a kind of a four-part uh, question to introduce you. So let's begin with that. For our audience, could you please introduce yourself and let's start with where you grew up. Okay. Well, I was uh, born and raised in New Delhi, India, and it was in 2011 that my family and I decided to immigrate to Canada, and now we call Vancouver home. Very good. Thank you. So uh, where did you go to school and what did you study? Well, I went to um, Delhi University and I completed a bachelor's in uh, science. I specialized in community resource management and education. I then uh, went and did my MBA and I majored in marketing with a minor in human resource development. And after moving to Canada, I also completed a certificate in adult and continued education from University of Victoria. Uh, it's funny, you know, many people that are new to l and they believe that people enter this industry and it's always a straight path, but that's actually far from the truth, at least for me. And, and, and I know for many others too, you know, I am what I call an accidental instructional designer. Um, after I completed my MBA program in 1999, I started to, you know, receive offers from companies for marketing jobs because that, that's what I'd specialized and majored in. And at some point, I also considered uh, working as a copywriter uh, with an ad agency. But I actually decided to join uh, NIIT, which uh, is a multinational technology company, and I joined as a technical writer. Um, so... Um, you never know where things connect and how you start and how you progress. Very true. I think that's part of the lesson that I hope the audience uh, gets from this series is that most people didn't start out deliberately intending to become instructional designers or developers. They, they somehow got there. And so this is part of uh, the story as to uh, what your journey was. So now you're in Vancouver and are, who are you working for and what are you doing right now? Okay, well, yes, I live and work in Vancouver, BC in Canada. And um, after um, you know, my, my 10 successful years uh, in NIT and um, I, I left NIT in 2009, and then we started to apply for Canadian immigration. And uh, as you may know or may not know, it's a very long drawn process. And while that was happening, I started to apply for jobs in Canada. And I actually started working with my current company, which is called North Pacific, while I was still in India. Um, I physically moved to Vancouver in 2011, and I've been working with uh, North Pacific since then, so 11, 12 years now. And here, I basically specialize in designing competency-based occupational standards and training. Um, I also do certification and assessment programs, again, competency-based. And more recently, I've been designing and delivering, uh, you know, recognition of prior learning models for both technical and non-technical um, occupations. Um, there's been so much variety in my life and um, in my L&D career, I've, I've got a chance to work with government organizations and industry associations sector councils, private training companies, you know, developing training programs and competency frameworks and um, assessment tools and working with shipbuilders and home inspectors and hairstylists and um, early childhood educators. What else? Um, career development practitioners. So lots, lots of variety. So it's been a fun and adventurous ride, even with North Pacific here in Vancouver. 
Yes, I think that that's, that that's one of the nice things when you have the opportunity to work with a wide variety of industries and job titles. Um, you That really is a, a growth experience because you learn a little bit about a lot of different jobs and and uh, and performances, processes, et cetera. Uh, so let's shift gears here a little bit. So uh, the series is HPT, Human Performance Technology. It's been called a lot of different things over the decades and a lot of things currently. It's also known as HPI, Human Performance Improvement, which is kind of the ends to the means of human performance technology. And back in the day, this used to be called just performance technology, but it's all about having a performance orientation to improving performance through instruction or various other means. But can you share with us how you first came across this or how, you know, how, you, how, you, how I stumbled upon you and your performance orientation? Is there some backstory you can share with us? Well, I mean, this was one of the interesting questions, and uh, and I was trying to think about, you know, where I got exposed to HPT for the first time, and and I think it was actually in early two thousands, and um, this was when I read an article actually by ISPI, and they used to publish this, uh, these newsletters, and this was an article about, uh, you know, highlight that highlighted the importance of problem solving as um, applied to human performance, and that the tone of that article just appealed to my logical mind and it directly spoke to some of the things that I had learned in my MBA days, you know, in organizational development and human resource development, um, you know, things like systems thinking and planned interventions. And at that time I was working with NIT and I was leading the design and development of custom e-learning and blended learning programs, typically following the um, ADI model for designing instruction. And, uh, you know, I did design simulation-based training and use the core concepts of learning by doing, but there was still a lot of learning design to know. Um, and I didn't quite, at that point, really had questioned creating a learning invention, intervention and, and using just training as one of the solutions for that. Um, I think over, over time, I started to explore more about HPT systems and, um, uh, back in 20, I don't know, 2002 or three, maybe somewhere, somewhere around that time, NIT acquired Cognitive Arts. Um, and Cognitive Arts was actually a spin-off of Northwestern University under um, Dr. Roger Shank, you know, who's quite well known for leveraging cognitive research in designing and delivering simulation-based learning. And there, uh, working with uh, you know, Dr. Greg Collins, I understood uh, this proprietary methodology about called critical mistakes analysis, which uh, basically focused on like having a practical framework to identify mistakes that have maximum business impact and then designing learning uh, experiences around those specific mistakes. So it applied the Pareto principle, uh, you know, essentially saying that 20% of the mistakes cause 80% of poor performance at work. And that's when I truly started to learn about HPT and evidence-based practices for performance Im improvement. I mean, these days I, I refer it, um, you know, more as competency development, because for me, that's what relates to performance improvement, uh, both for the individual, but also for the organization or even the country. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, uh, that background. So, uh, so besides Roger Shank and that one thing that you read from ISPI, can you identify, particularly for our audience, you know, so who, who or what? Uh, was influential to you and your practices that you could share with our audience. So, and I'm talking about early in your career. So people who are new and early in their career, um, what might you suggest that you found uh, valuable to you in your professional development? Again, I mean, so much. I, I think because my entry into um, L&D started with designing e-learning, I think perhaps one of my first books on instructional design was um, e-learning and the science of instruction by Ruth Clark and Richard Mayer. And it was, it was like a fantastic introduction to why do we do things the way we do? You know, why do we make particular design decisions? And I think it's a great choice, uh, you know, for a first book because it also had research-based guidelines on, on how to present 
uh, content with uh, text and graphics and audio and so on. And from there, I moved on to um, uh, Richard Mayer's multimedia learning and the principles of uh, multimedia-based instructional design. Um, I also, I, I think principles of uh, instructional design by Gane um, and Keller, you know, that also had a tremendous impact on my understanding of the principles of learning and my practice of instructional design from more uh, of a cognitive psychology information processing lens. Um, I, I, I think when I started to truly understand HPD and the importance of performance, that's when I started to learn more about uh, you know, the behavior engineering model by Gilbert. And of course, I got, I got much more tuned to the ISPI HPD model. And uh, uh, perhaps one of, the, one of the earlier books that I also came across was, um, you know, Harold Stolovich's uh, Telling in Training and, and then eventually Training in Performance. And a funny thing is, you know, how life comes full circle. My current boss actually used to work with Harold Stolovich at HSA Associates. And I also got a chance to invite him and listen to him uh, talk about, uh, you know, how training is a very blunt and overly expensive instrument that's used to impact performance. So we invited him as a part of the ISPI workshop in uh, Vancouver chapter. And uh, I, I think um, I'm preaching to the choir here, but even your books, your articles, your YouTube videos, I mean, you've always shared endless resources, have always kept the focus on performance analysis and performance-based instructional systems uh, design. And, and that has been important. Gosh, there's so many people. Um, Donald Clark, I think his website on instructional systems design was, was also uh, offered a great resource for me um, when I started off in the industry. Um, and uh, in North Pacific, of course, my bosses and my mentors, uh, Jim Tolman and Dan McFall, who introduced me to the DACOM process for occupational analysis. And again, kept, uh, kept the focus on performance consulting and, uh, you know, and make that shift from being in the business of training to being in the business of performance. Mm -hmm. Those are some fabulous people and resources you've mentioned, but uh, um, when I think of people like Ruth Clark and Harold Stolovich and, and many, many others, I you know, first met them and, and became aware of their work um, back at NSPI, which is now ISPI, uh, back in the late 70s and early 80s. And Harold Stolovich is just you know, somebody that really impressed me. I think I saw him present at the Detroit chapter what's now ISPI back in 1980. And, and he just thrilled me in terms of, uh, he was such an energetic speaker and he's such a fine individual. Um, but let me shift gears a little bit here because we're gonna get back a, a little bit later to some of the more current uh, influences that you're finding. But, but let's shift gears right now. And, and I wanna ask you, uh, it, this is to provide an example to people in our audience, but. But if you were to give us a 30 second elevator speech on what it is that you do, what would that be? Gosh, <laughs> you know, a very difficult question. It's so tough to put down in words, uh, you know, what we do, because in, in many ways, it's also constantly evolving. But I did think about it. So I'm going to give it a try. Um, like many organizations, you know, they're designing and delivering training, but they find that there is that little or no learning is taking place. And while thousands of dollars are being invested in training, sometimes there's not even a small dent that we make in the actual work performance. Um, like in my work, uh, in, in the business of performance that I've been in over 23 years now, I've realized that at the outset, people want to have a more clear understanding of the behaviors that they should exhibit and the level of performance that's expected for them in order to achieve results. So my role is that I work with organizations to design these well-structured and clear competency frameworks that organizations can use to align their staff recruitment, skilling, and performance management practices with their own organizational priorities and goals. Um, and as a part of the work that I do, I've helped uh, organizations define and develop 
uh, recognize and even assess competencies and, um, you know, design workplace learning experiences and competency-based certification programs that align with the business and needs, and, but also impact real life work performance. I think at the end of it all, I just love helping people uh, learn. And it's so rewarding when that learning transfers, you know, to the job. So it, it not only helps the people unlock their own capabilities and potential, but it also helps organizations reach that next level of growth. And, and that's where I, I work. Thank you for that. Let me shift gears here yet again. Okay. As a long learner, uh, do you have a current focus for, for your own learning? And can you share that with us? And are you writing about it or anything that people could follow up with? But so what's your focus for learning currently? Well, I mean, I love to learn. And I also believe that the student and the teacher reside in each of us. Um, outside of work, there are lots of things that I like to stay involved in. And one of my passions is instructing. Um, I'm an instructor with the University of Victoria, and I teach a course in instructional design as a part of the certificate in adult and continuing education. Um, this is a certificate program that attracts those who are already in the field and are looking to improve their practice of instructional design. Um, I'm also an instructor with BC Campus, so which is an organization here in BC that's funded by the Ministry of Advanced Education and Skills uh, Training. And the objective for that is to support post-secondary institutions in BC to you know, evolve their teaching uh, and learning practices. Um, and, and there, my, my audience is largely instructors and professors that are teaching in post-secondary institutions. Um, and for BC campus, my focus has been, uh, you know, doing a lot of uh, workshops and courses on universal design for learning. I just um, completed a micro learning course in February um, on UDL, and I have a new workshop on using UDL as a lens for intentional instructional design, which is coming up in May. Um, I think over the last few years, I've also started to explore and add my voice more to the value of diversity and inclusion in the practice of instructional design. Um, other than these, I like to volunteer. Uh, my parents were serial volunteers and my dad who's currently in his eighties uh, is probably volunteering right at this time as we talk. Um, as an immigrant, Myself, I was so sensitized to the process of um, immigration and how it impacts our sense of belonging and our sense of being. And so when we moved to Canada, I started to get myself involved in immigrant serving organizations and I started to participate in family uh, mentoring and career mentoring for new immigrants to Canada. I currently serve uh, on the board of ISS of BC, which is um, one of the largest immigrant serving organizations here in BC and um, I serve as a vice president. I think as a volunteer, I've received far more than I have given and I would encourage everybody to do so. I think I also participate with other organizations like ILO, which is the International Labor Organization. We just, um, I was invited to be a subject matter expert on designing a MOOC, uh, which is a massive open online learning course on design, on recognition of prior learning models. So I, I've got my I've got my fingers in so many pies. Uh, it's it's quite amazing. It there there is so much to learn in such little time. Well, thank you for sharing all of that. Um, I, I will put in our show notes uh, links to you on YouTube and Twitter and anywhere else that you can share with me, um, I'll include that so people can follow up and maybe uh, see about some of the things that you're doing and, and if, there, if any of that might be available to them in the public if they're in that area or if you're doing virtual things. Yeah, and, and I do also blog. I've been blogging since the early 2000s. So that's also one of the places where I tend to kind of reflect on the current themes in my professional life and as a way to capture some of my ideas and insights. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll be sure to share that as well. Let me again shift gears to uh, terminology, our language. Um, I've been asking this question for a couple of decades now about uh, 
is there a particular performance improvement term or a phrase that you would like to define for us? And perhaps you would like to address it because you feel it's being misused or misconstrued or that you just want to put your particular spin on it. But do you have a, a, a term or a phrase that you would share with us? Yes, actually, as a matter of fact, I do. And this this came to me, um, uh, you know, because of the work. So I've also been volunteering as a part of an um, IEEE group. And IEEE is, is a technical professional organization um, uh, that believe that standardization is the foundation on which technology innovation is based. And as a part of that group, um, uh, we are working on publishing some recommended practices for defining competencies. And oh, as I was working uh, uh, in that group, I realized that there is a lot of confusion about what makes a competency. And I mean, in, increasingly, we've seen that there's a shift, you know, in the way we are discussing jobs um, and now the conversation moved to skills and now we are also talking about competencies and while skills and competencies are terms that are used interchangeably I, I think there are important differences um, to highlight um, for me a competency is is something that includes um, knowledge abilities and aptitudes but also skills so it, it's something that a person can do and the person must demonstrate in order to be more effective in a job or a role or a, or a task. Uh, it's also the ability to uh, you know, uh, perform consistently and efficiently. But I think one of the, the, cre the, the key things that people tend to miss uh, is that competencies includes knowledge components that are uh, contextual. So not all competencies are always completely transferable. So if I had to kind of differentiate skills and competencies, I would say competencies take the skills and incorporate them into on the job behaviors in specific contexts. So that's, that's something that has been on my mind. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to kind of take my own spin on, uh, on competencies. Well, I like that very much. It's very much akin to, I think, what Gilbert was talking about in his book, Human Competence. Yes. It's the, it's, the, uh, it's the outputs or accomplishments of tasks and behaviors. And it's kind of that whole uh, set of things. It's not just one enabling skills like active listening or spreadsheets or something like that. So I really like your uh, your spin on that term. That I, I'm very okay. that. <laughs> Um, so let's go back uh, again now to this issue or my question of, you know, who more recently uh, are you following and learning from so that we can share those names or those books or those articles with our audience and uh, perhaps guide them to uh, some of the things that you're finding more recently in your career that... Uh, uh, have had a positive impact in your practice. Yes, and um, you know, I know you're talking about things that are more recent, but I'm going to use the term recent a little loosely because I'm also going back to the 2000s, and and many of these people continue to influence my practice to the day. Um, I I think the work by Charles Jennings and the 70 20 10 model and how to integrate learning in the workflow. Um, Jay Cross um, and his work on supporting and nurturing and leveraging informal learning. Uh, from Canada, I've been influenced by Harold Jarsh and his work on you know, personal knowledge mastery and connecting work and learning. Um, who else? Yes, Jane Hart and her work on modern workplace learning and, and also the evolving role of L&D as, as uh, a professional, um, and another Jane, Dr. Jane Bozart, and her work on specifically capturing tacit knowledge and, and showing your work. Um, Patty Shank, I think, who focuses on evidence-based practices and more specifically on the value of, you know, practice and feedback and 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 off late a lot of work that she's been doing on designing uh, better multiple choice questions. Um, who else? Will Timer, who uh, who did his work on performance-focused file sheets and 
how to seek you know, better training evaluation data so that we measure what really matters and, and we make decisions accordingly. Um, and I think Kathy Moore's work on action mapping, I, I think that those are some of the, the more recent, you know, um, influences on my practice of instructional design. Um, and uh, the two books uh, that came to my mind, you know, as I was thinking about this question was uh, one, um, The Accidental Instructional Designer, that's by Cami Bean, and then Julie Duxon's work in uh, Designing for How People Learn. I, I think these, these are really, really interesting and good books to kind of, you know, um, learn more about learning. And I think uh, as a part of her re uh, work with the uh, Learning Guild, um, Dr. Jane Bozart actually crowdsourced some of the favorite books, uh, you know, work-related books, uh, which were more most impact, uh, impactful on learning practitioners. And I would totally recommend uh, people to check out uh, that resource on the Learning Guild. In fact, I have found the best people and the best resources uh, via participation in all of these l and communities, including those on Twitter, you know, in fact, things like Learn Chat and Guild Chat, um, but also the Learning Guild, and then the Training, Learning and Development Community or the TLDC Community. And now, of course, I've become a part of the UDL committees, uh, community. So I, I think even things like Twitter and LinkedIn and being active in online communities has uh, influenced my practice of instructional design. Well, thank you for uh, mentioning all of those names. Those are good people and good resources that you've identified. Um, thank you so much for doing this video interview with me. So I have one final question for you before we wrap up. Do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, especially those who are somewhat new to the field you know, related to all things performance improvement? This is such a great question, Guy. And uh, again, uh, and all your questions made me think, but this one in particular. Um, and since for the last few years, UDL has been on top of my mind. One of the, the key objectives of UDL is to develop expert learners. And uh, when I say expert learners, the expertise that we seek here is, is not in the subject area that's being taught. In, instead, it's more about the expertise associated with learning how to learn and uh, doing it more strategically and purposely. And uh, as as some and sub and uh, as some would say, it is the mastery of learning rather than the mastery of knowledge. So I mean, in in that sense, expert learners are the ones who set goals, who who make choices about their learning, and also who reflect on their learning. So I guess my parting words of wisdom is to always strive to be an expert learner. That's what I would encourage, you know, uh, for people who are new to the field, but for everyone who's practicing, whether in the performance and L&D field or any other field. And for me, the one way that I found uh, to do that and, and to continue to strive to be an expert learner is to approach my own learnability, I guess, and learning expertise as a continuum. So, uh, you know, and knowing that I'm moving along that continuum with everything that I do, with every dot that I can connect. And also I think to, to view learning as a process uh, rather than as a product, because at the end of the day, I guess learning is about transformation. It's about change and it's about seeing yourself uh, in relation to the, to the world differently. So um, that's uh, what I would encourage everybody to, to do, be an expert learner. Karuna, thank you so much for sharing all of this with us today. Uh, have a great day. Thank you, Guy.